Hello. Well, uh, now I want to introduce uh, the final uh, two volumes of diaries. There's volume two, uh, Sato's Diaries for 1921 to 1926. And um, uh, other, some illustrations. Um, for example, there's one of Beaumont House there, where Sato lived in retirement. Um, re reproduced with the permission of the Yokama archives. Um, this is actually Sato in his library at Beaumont in 1924, October the 4th, actually. Again, re reproduced with the permission of the Yokohama archives. Um, and uh, I actually went there to Sato's house. And this is part of it on the, there we are the so-called loggia. Um, and finally, there's um, his head, his gravestone. Uh, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, in the Ottery St. Mary churchyard, St. Mary's church, um, at the bottom of which it says, blessed are the peacemakers. Although that, that part is usually hidden by grass. Um, all right, so um, volume one of uh, this two volume set with the orange cover, paperback set, uh, includes the preface and the foreword um, by Robert Morton. The preface is by myself, so I shall read both, starting with the preface and then Robert Morton's foreword. Um, okay, here we go. Preface. These two volumes are an annotated and indexed transcription of the last known diaries of Sir Ernest Mason Sato, PC, GCMG, 1843 to 1929. The diaries comprise 47 hand -bound, handwritten bound volumes, all deposited in the National Archives of the United Kingdom, formerly the Public Record Office. They begin with young Sato, just 18 years old, leaving Southampton by ship for the Far East on November the 4th, 1861, full of hope, curiosity, and a spirit of adventure. They end in Ottery St. Mary, Devon, on December the 31st, 1926, with Sato at 83 years of age, somewhat concerned about his health. He had experienced giddiness on the previous day, but still going for walks in his neighborhood, well enough to read for pleasure and to list in his diary friends and acquaintances who had died during the year as he did every year from 1911 onwards um, at the end of the year. His retirement from the diplomatic service had begun in 1906, but he continued to lead a full and active life thereafter as his subsequent diary entries clearly, diaries clearly show. In completing these final volumes, I do feel satisfaction because Sato's life was long and very interesting throughout. He is very familiar to Japanese and non-Japanese scholars who are interested in the Bakumatsu, the end of the Tokugawa shogunate, thanks mainly to his A Diplomat in Japan, first published in 1921, which describes the years 1862 to 69 in Japan. He is also very well known to scholars of diplomacy and diplomatic history, thanks to his Guide to Diplomatic Practice, first published in 1917, with the centenary seventh edition published last year. Uh, that was, uh, nine, well, 2017, yeah. These two important books are substantial living monuments to the man and his achievements, and the publication of all his diaries, in a sense, joins the dots between them, allowing us to learn something of his daily grind and activities, though he rarely allows his emotions to show. No work of this nature is completed in isolation, and I should like to record here my sincerest gratitude to Professor Robert Morton, who co-authored the first volume of the diaries, that was 1861 to 69, and to those scholars, some deceased, who have been a great help and inspiration since I began to study and research Sato's life and letters in 1993. Sir Hugh Cortazzi, Dr. Nigel Braley, Professor Ian Nish, Dr. James E. Hoare, Professor T.G. Ote, Sir David Warren, Mr. Shozo Nagaoka, and Professor Peter Kornitsky. The first six named have all kindly written forwards or introductions to at least one volume of the diaries. All errors are mine.
Ian Ruxton. Now, Robert Morton's forward. I was privileged to work with Professor Ruxton on transcribing and annotating the first extant diaries of Ernest Sartos, those from 1861 to 1869. So I had the feeling of coming full circle when reading this last set. In those first diaries, Sato was a very young man. They were written from the ages of 18 to 25. And in these, he is old from 77 to 83. In spite of the gap between them, for the most part, he is identifiably the same person. Admittedly, he completely lost the sense of adventure and recklessness so evident in his youth, but still had the same curiosity and wide interests. Natural history was one, and the entry for the 2nd of January 1921 in this volume could have come from the earlier one. Today, two snowdrops, Muscari corulia, a few light-colored polyanthus open, crocus crocuses putting up their pointed leaves, three of what I conjecture to be dog-tooth violets, in bed to right of pergola. Even more pronounced is that he exhibits the same enthusiasm for learning new things in old age as he did when he was young. This is particularly true of languages, including ones that could have been of little or no use to him. In the earlier diaries, we find out that in addition to learning Chinese and Japanese, he was also studying Manchu. In later life, it is Polish and Danish that he is learning, although he gives up both. In the case of Danish, he reluctantly concludes that Kierkegaard is too difficult for him to read in that language. Kierkegaard said, I conceived it as my task to create difficulties everywhere. He is hardly easy in any language. However, the older Sato can comfortably manage many other languages, reading literature in French, German, Spanish, Italian, Dutch, Greek, and Latin, and is working away at his Russian. He also, of course, knew Chinese and Japanese, but he records reading nothing in Chinese in old age and precious little in Japanese. He mentions receiving volume one of a history of Christianity in Japan in Japanese, but did not read it. And he obtains a Japanese translation of Dante's works, but only describes examining and identifying passages in it. His seemingly unquenchable passion for reading and writing Japanese, so evident in the first diaries, had disappeared. Indeed, there is not much about Japan in these diaries, considering that he had lived there for so many years and virtually nothing about South America or the Arab world, though he had lived in Uruguay and Morocco. His interests had returned squarely to Europe. These interests are mostly about the past, often the recent past, and there are very few comments on current affairs. We can, however, deduce that he did not much like David Lloyd George, prime minister from 1916 to 1922, writing of the blunders of his foreign policy, 1st of February, 1923 letter, uh, sorry, entry, diary entry. Although he does seem to get credit from Sato for preventing the French occupying the Ruhr, a diary entry of 8th of November, 1923. Sato was also no fan of the Labour Party, quoting approvingly a Times leading article which spoke of the shuffling intrigues, the bastard internationalism, the unpractical theorizing and the class hatred of the Labour government, 8th of November, 1924. Much of Sato's time was taken up with serious reading. He shows little interest in fiction apart from Walter Scott's Waverley novels, which he clearly adored. His main interest is in reading difficult books about history or philosophy in their original language. We watch him masochistically plowing through Die Grosse Politik der Europäischen Kabinette, a 40 volume work which presented the official German view of World War I. As an indication of how it dominated his life, the words die grosse Politik appear more than 300 times in these diaries. He reads some of it nearly every day for about two and a half years. In spite of comments like, very pleased to see that there is only one chapter left of volume 25, part two, 18th of July, 1925 diary entry. He finally seems to give up on it after 17th of July, 1926, when he finished chapter 265 of volume 33, because we do not hear about it again after that. Praise be. <clears throat> he reads copiously in French, including the essays of Montaigne, although skipping a considerable part of the indecencies, 23rd of April, 1923, presumably the uninhibited musings on l'action génitale, which the 18-year-old Sato would surely have been very interested in. 
There is little emotion expressed in these diaries and he rarely describes feeling either particularly happy or sad. To us, this perhaps seems a dull and colorless way to carry on, but he may have deliberately cultivated this way of being. The Hellenistic philosophers whose works he was so fond of reading, in the original Greek, of course, believed that the way to achieve eudaimonia or happiness was ataraxia, controlling your emotions and maintaining an even keel, feeling neither joy when things went well or plunging into despair in adversity. The many deaths of people he knew seemed to cause him no sorrow and, and indeed he appears to get grim satisfaction from recording them. The exceptions are the deaths of Canon Pryke, P-R-Y-K-E, and two of his brothers, David and Sam, but even they only inspire the briefest expressions of grief. Sam, uh, Sam Sato and his children were evidently the people closest to him at this point in his life. They are often mentioned in the diaries and we discover that he planned to leave his house to Sam's son, Harold, and half of his invested funds to his daughter, Nora. Sato's reaction to the death of another brother seems very cold. A telegram from Ethel that my brother Charles died this morning, aged 79, a dull, mild morning, 21st of October, 1925. Also very chilly is his failure to record any response at all to the death of his son. A letter tells me that Alfred died at 10.30 p.m. on the 15th inst. After my guests had left, I continued reading Buancare's book till I went to dress for dinner, 30th of June, 1926 which in fact was his birthday as well, um, extraordinary. Is he holding his grief in? Perhaps. Professor Ruxton suggests in a footnote that it must have been a hard blow, but there is nothing in what Sato writes to indicate that this was so. There is indeed remarkably little mention of his Japanese family. His common law wife, Takeda Okane, is never referred to by name, but by the name of the location of their house in Tokyo, Fujimicho. That said, he clearly feels a responsibility towards them. For example, when he hears that the house was damaged in the great Kanto earthquake of 1923, he makes arrangements to send money to cover the cost of the repairs, diary entry of 9th of July, 1924. It looks like he did what he saw as his duty towards his Japanese family, but nothing more. Alternatively, he may have felt that his diary was not an appropriate place to write much regarding them, and he actually cared very deeply about them. We simply cannot tell from what he has written. The diary was mainly used for describing happenings rather than opinions or feelings. It was probably mostly maintained as a record for later reference. He writes a number of times of consulting old diaries. But did he also write it with the thought in the back of his mind that others would read it? He would have known that his earlier diaries, particularly the 1861 to 1869 ones, were of interest to historians. Indeed, he used these to write a diplomat in Japan. But he also directed that this 1921 to 1926 set be deposited in the public record office, making it available to anybody who was interested. Perhaps he was reticent about mentioning his Japanese family for this reason. But if that is the case, why did he write about them at all? His colleagues in Japan, his colleague in Japan, A.B. Mitford, never mentioned his Japanese partner and child in writing anywhere. It is hard to overstate how scandalous a secret Japanese wife, in inverted commas, and two sons would have seemed to 1920s England for a man in Sato's position. And it is easy to imagine him being blackmailed if a malicious person found out about them. He must have felt great stress from leading an ultra respectable life while having this, what would have been perceived as deeply shameful element in his life and perhaps felt the need to write about them in a roundabout and scanty way so that if the diary somehow fell into the wrong hands, his secret would not come out. For the most part, the diary is the record of a carefully ordered life with any exceptions to this standing out. One of these is in the entry for 8th of August, 1923. Did not wake till half past eight and had to admit, omit two chief parts of my toilet. He did not need to be ready for a certain time, but clearly felt the need to adhere to his personal schedule and perhaps to avoid upsetting the routine of his servants. He dressed for dinner, even when he had no, no guests. At the same time, there are a few surprises. One would have expected him to often have his hair trimmed. Photographs of him in later life show him with an impeccable appearance, but in fact, he only had his hair cut once every three months or so. He had it cut on the 23rd of July and not again until 13th of October in 1924. He was a bit casual about his role as a magistrate. Petty sessions, but I forgot to go down, 9th of May, 
1923. He often writes about church attendance, but was a little patchy about it. He tells us on 8th of March, 1925, that he was attending matins for the first time since 18th of January. Admittedly, he had been under the weather for quite a lot of that gap. Nevertheless, he was very serious about his faith, being punctilious about his private devotions. When describing a typical day, he says, before going to bed, I read a passage of scripture for the day as prescribed by the Kurgaven, a book of Bible readings for every day of the year. I think that's a Dutch book. And the section of that book for the day, then I prepare the piece of the NT, New Testament or Psalms and the prayers for tomorrow morning, except Sundays, 6th of June, 1924. Sorry, it's not I read a passage, it's I read a, I read a passage of scripture for the day. This is in addition to reading the Bible as part of his study of other languages. For example, on the 10th of May, 1924, he read Genesis chapter 10 in Russian and Matthew chapter 10 in Danish. He led a fairly active social life, but seems to have taken satisfaction in turning people down and never accepts invitations from anyone outside his circle of family and friends. He refuses all the invitations uh, he received to events for the Crown Prince of Japan, Emperor Showa, including a banquet at Buckingham Palace. While he moves around a lot in his locality, he does not go anywhere very much outside it. The only traveling of any distance he describes in this volume is occasional trips to London and Oxford and a trip to Ilfracum for his brother David's funeral. He refuses the invitation to deliver six lessons on les méthodes de travail de la diplomatie in The Hague, in spite of the generous remuneration offered because the request was too sudden and left me no time to think over the shape that such a series of lecture, lectures should take. 10th of December, 1923, diary entry. He had in fact been given seven months to prepare them. He was not quite a hypochondriac, but he was certainly very interested in and mindful of his health. For example, when his doctor told him that he should not smoke more than two ounces of tobacco a week, he made a careful calculation and found his consumption to be two pounds in 113 days or 32 ounces in 17 weeks, just under the allowance. Entry of 15th of June, 1924. He remained physically fit, taking walks and sawing wood for exercise. On the 20th of August, 1924, he walked 20 miles, which is good going for an 81 year old. It certainly is. He did not much like modern things. He had no telephone, which would surely have been useful for making arrangements with his wide circle of acquaintances. He was also without a car, although he occasionally accepted lifts, generally relying on the none too reliable trains. On the 28th of July, 1925, he writes of going to Exeter for a committee of the blind institution and being so late that he did not get there until it was nearly over. He also resisted electricity in spite of the fact that a neighbor offered to share the expenses, expense of installing electric lighting in their houses. There is no mention of a radio or a phonograph. His attitude towards money is of a certain interest. In some ways, he lived extravagantly. Beaumont was a big house for one person and he maintained a sizable household. He never sets out who his staff are, so it is quite difficult to keep track of them all. He had his Japanese servant, Saburo, who seems to have been a kind of valet and companion to him. And there were two gardeners, Jared and Salter. Ellen Lovell was an important servant being described at one stage as a parlor maid and acting as head of the household. She must have been remarkably well off for someone in that position because she went on holiday to the Canary mm -hmm. Islands. There were also Annie Finnessy and Edith Bond, both housemaids. When Edith Bond became sick, she was replaced by Edith Harris, and there is yet another housemaid mentioned, Etris Cook. Sato's cook was Florence Summers, S-O-M-E-R-S, who married Salter, one of the gardeners, and was replaced by Mrs. Tilt, T-I-L-T. -T. At any given time, he had a staff of seven or so. He was fairly generous with, his wage, with wages. For example, Mrs. Tilt was paid 38 pounds, while a typical cook in a small household at that time usually got close to 30 pounds. Uh, would that be monthly, I suppose? I'm not sure. He was particularly kind to Annie Finnessy, covering her medical expenses arising from her trouble with her eyes, and he also supported impoverished relations. At one point, all this became overwhelming. Edith has written asking me to help her pay the cost of Ivan's illness, but in view of my expenditure for Theodore's widow and Annie Finnessy, I have replied that I cannot at present promise anything for I have no idea how long Jesse Martha's illness will last. 
25th of February, 1921. While he was often generous to others, he could be quite stingy with himself. He almost never traveled first class on the trains, which would have seemed strange for a man in his position. And he was careful about book purchases and bought little other than books. All in all, Sato comes across in this last set of diaries as a disciplined, imperturbable, dutiful, kind, intellectual figure, perhaps someone more to admire than to love. He had, th he had, though, been a great man who in his prime had been at the heart of earth-shaking events. These diaries should, have be, should be seen in the context of his others, which have now been fully transcribed and annotated, completing a record that spans 65 years. They chart the traje trajectory of a man who was not born into the class that diplomats came from, but reached the heights of the profession through sheer talent and hard work. He undoubtedly looked back on his working life with a feeling of pride and satisfaction, as should Professor Ruxton, who with this volume has finally completed an immense labor and left historians with a precious record of a remarkable life and times. Robert Morton, who is a professor at Chuo University in Tokyo and a good friend. Uh, and I thank him very much for this excellent introduction, uh, forward, I should say. Okay. Um, well, there are a few other um, diary forwards to read um, from Sato's earlier diaries. But uh, anyway, I will stop here now. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>